When we look back upon this time, when we look back upon this pandemic, the only thing that we shall see, the only thing that we'll notice is the love that we've gained or the love that we've lost. One year from now, looking back upon our actions and the way we behaved in the world towards the people around us, the only thing that will be noticeable, the only thing weighing on our conscience will be the love we've gained or the love we've lost, depending on how we responded, how we reacted to all of this. Because this will pass. This will pass. Sooner or later, this will pass. And what will be left is just us, these shells, empty shells of our beings, filled with more love or more hatred. You see, the great temptation is to think that just because this is a difficult time, just because this is an extraordinary time, somehow the rules have changed, somehow the commandments of Christ have been adapted or diluted somehow. And that has never been the case, and that can never be the case, because the commandments of Christ are nothing else except descriptions of who God himself is. And Christ is simply asking us to be like God. When Christ tells us to love our neighbor, when Christ tells us to forgive 70 times 7, when Christ teaches us about obedience and endurance and patience, that's not because these are somehow the virtues that are high up on his list of virtues. He is simply telling us who he as God is, and he is inviting us describing to us what we need to do in order to become God-like. And because God never changes, His commandments to us cannot change, because His will for us is always the same, that we should be saved, which means that we become Christ-like, God-like. We were created in this image in order to actualize that potential into a reality. God doesn't change, and therefore His commandments do not change because we live through times of peace or times of war, through times of health or times of pandemics. Nothing has changed, and our actions and us, we shall be judged and we shall judge ourselves according to the same criteria as at any other given moment in the history of this church. Trust the church, not your own wisdom. Trust that this church that has survived through real persecution, not what we are going through, has survived through the persecution of the first three, four, five centuries of its history, has survived through centuries of occupation by the Ottoman Empire, has survived through the horrors of communism. Trust that this church, it will also survive this year-long pandemic. My wisdom is nothing compared to the wisdom of the church. And with all love, all the love I have, I tell you the same thing about yourself. Your wisdom, your experience is nothing compared to the experience the millennia-old experience of this church that has survived through real persecution. This is not a time of persecution. This is, I'm embarrassed and ashamed to even use our time in the same sentence with the times of the holy martyrs of the first centuries or the times of those martyrs during the occupation of the Ottoman Empire or the times of communist regime. We are the modern martyrs, aren't we? The ones who have everything we need. We live in the comforts of our homes. We are free to call ourselves Christians. We live in countries that do not kill us for being who we are. 
we think that the main enemy is actually the church itself, the bishops themselves. This is our new modern martyrdom. May God protect us against that kind of martyrdom. May God protect us against this kind of spiritual temptation because we would not be the first ones to fall into that. This is not a time of persecution. What rules us right now? What makes us think and behave as if we were persecuted. Anger is the primary force behind the actions of anyone who decides to disobey their own bishops, whatever their bishops may say. If your bishop tells you to do something and you disobey your bishop, and there is no reason, canonical, dogmatic reason for that disobedience, and there is none, at this moment, then my dear beloved one, you are not a martyr who is persecuted for your faith. You are just controlled by your own anger. Do you remember that rush of blood, that flow of blood that climbs to your head, that shot of adrenaline that comes with any temptation. Can you recollect the adrenaline that comes with anger? Can you recollect the rush of blood that comes with greed or with lust? The same applies now. This is the chaos of temptation. When temptation descends upon us, there's that darkness that makes us not think clearly anymore. We act in haste, we act with anger, we act based on impulses instead of following the commandments, instead of having the calmness and the patience and the endurance that shapes a true Christian. Anger and obedience shape one's being to the same degree but who you become, shaped by anger, is a far cry away from whom you could become if you are shaped by your endurance. Both anger and impulsiveness and patience, endurance and obedience, both these categories are chisels that shape who we become, are fires that burn something in us, but what they burn is very different. Anger, a person who gives himself or herself to anger, will burn everything good in him or in her, and will feed everything that is from the evil one. Obedience and patience will burn with an equally bright fire and it is a painful cross to take upon oneself. But this fire will burn the evil things in oneself and will allow, will prepare the ground, the soil for the good seeds of true virtues to grow. This is a period of chaos and of darkness because we have allowed ourselves to be carried forward in this temptation. We have allowed ourselves to be controlled by anger. The truth is simple. Anger feels good. Anger and demonizing someone else feels good and serves every wrong thing in our being. To be angry and to look down upon someone, to paint someone else as being worse than you are, to focus on someone else and to depict him or her as being lower than you are, and then to be angry and condemn that person. That feels good because comparing yourself with that someone who is not the real person, but only an image you have built, you have constructed of that person, compared to that low image of that person, you look virtuous, you feel good. Whereas repentance and humility and always 
Blaming oneself does not feel good at all. Feels like a constant cross. Feels like you are in a constant position of tension, in a constant position that kills you, that position of the crucifixion. We are now like children having a tantrum. We want things done our way and now. How do you mean I cannot get things done the way I want them done? How do you mean they cannot be solved right now in the manner in which I think they should be resolved? That is so typical of our fast food society, of our society that values individualism and pride and a personal solution to everything, a go-get-it sort of attitude. But this is not Christianity, my dear ones. This is not love crucified. This has nothing to do with that. Disobedience and pride and anger are the main ingredients of our society today. They go with everything that this world of ours stands for. Whereas obedience and patience and endurance go against everything the world stands for, go against every value of this fast-forward, fast-food, impersonal world we have created for ourselves. We want to rebel against the world, well, the same rebellion is available to us as was available to the martyrs of the first centuries or the martyrs of communist prisons. We can rebel against the disobedience of this world by obeying to Christ. We can rebel against the pride of this world by being humble. We can rebel against the anger and the finger-pointing of this world, always identifying someone else to hate, in someone coming from another country, in someone looking differently, in someone who lives differently from us. And we can rebel against this anger and lack of love by judging ourselves and condemning ourselves and humbly keeping our heads down before God because the one who keeps his or her head down is the one whom Christ himself will lift up on the day of judgment. And this is what I pray for, for myself and for every single one of you with absolutely no exception. Our hearts belong to God. Give them to God and allow God through his shepherds and his church to guide you, to guide us through this moment of darkness to the light, because the light is there. The light will shine again. And when we look back upon this time, let's try to be spiritually proud of our reaction. Let's take pride in our love. Let's take pride in our sacrifice for the good of the ones around us. Let's take pride in our endurance and ability to bow down and to keep on going. Because these are the commandments of Christ. Nothing else, my dear ones. Nothing else. At this point, it feels almost like we are wasting time discussing a shell of a problem instead of addressing the, the real issues within the problem. Yes, this is not the ideal time. No, this is not a time of persecution. But let's move beyond this obvious level of our conversations. Yes, this is a moment of darkness. Yes, this is a temptation. What are we going to do? Are we going to just keep on banging our heads against the same wall, screaming, we are tempted, we are tempted, we are tempted? Yes, we are. So, what do we do about it? When are we going to talk 
all of us about how to pray better together, how to pray better for the world, how to learn and what to learn from this experience, how to exercise patience and endurance, how to exercise self-condemnation. What is there to learn from this moment of temptation, which can also be a moment of immense opportunity for our spiritual lives? Are we really going to keep on staring at the, at the wall of this temptation until the end of it and just say, oh, it's a temptation, it's a temptation. Yes, there is a temptation. Whether or not it's a big one, whether or not it's a major one, let's accept that we have different views on that. But when are we going to go beyond that and think and learn together how to do the things that truly matter. To love and to pray and to forgive and to endure and all those true Christian virtues. Are we really going to waste this entire time learning nothing? I love you from the toes of my feet to the top of my head. And I want nothing but what is absolutely best for you. What I pray for, for myself, I pray for you as well. Let us try to learn. Let us try to move forward a bit. Let's move the conversation a step forward. Let us learn how to stay away from anger and pointing fingers and condemning and move towards condemning ourselves and pointing fingers at ourselves and learning how to deepen the understanding of all the sacraments in our lives. We have such a great, immense, probably unique opportunity in our lives. Let us do all we can so we don't waste it. Because again, when we look back six months after all of this is over or a year after all of this is over, all we shall see, all we shall feel is the emptiness or the coldness of the love we lost or the fire of the love and the prayer and the intimate closeness to Christ that we have gained. May we all be blessed to the core of our being, dear ones. Amen.